morning, everybody. So uh, kind of a change in atmosphere and environment right now as we get back into some business. Um, I am Gary Jacobs. I work at Pricewaterhouse, but I'm also an at-large member of the board, and I came on in January. I have a lot of background. I owned a home health agency in Florida for years. And um, when I was asked, it was an honor to be involved with such a giving, prestigious, wonderful organization. So I congratulate all of you. I think you're all winners here today. What we're going to do today is kind of follow from the first plenary session and move to the idea of implementation of some of the new concepts and ideas that have emerged out of the new health economy. And I have a terrific team with me. Um, a lot of guys, <laughs> which is uh, interesting in this group. So Jeff Myers is president of the Medicaid Health Plans of America. Uh, his bi everybody's bio is in, I think, the, de the books you've got, so I won't go through any details. Everybody here has been in the business for a long time. They have a lot of insights to share with you, and we're going to get down into some nitty-gritty stuff as to the size of the market, um, and then what's happening in the field and how people are implementing these programs. Um, Michael Monson is um, Vice President of Long-Term Care and Dual Eligibles at Centene Corporation, which is a Fortune 500 company that is in the business of primarily serving uh, Medicaid and related populations. Um, Centene has emerged over the years as one of these innovative companies that has taken on the responsibility of caring for populations that heretofore were, were only in a fee-for-service environment and now as they move to a population management approach and a capitated or a fixed budget, they can show how it works. So Mike's going to give some interesting perspective on all of what Centene is doing. And then our last speaker is Ch Chad Westover. And Chad was from a larger company, but um, of recent, he's moved in the same state, in the same community, to a smaller regional pl uh, plan. He's from, uh, he's the C new CEO of the University of Utah uh, Health Plan. And Chad has a lot of experience in this area as well, and will bring, will enlighten you. And we're going to do discussion amongst ourselves. We're going to present, discuss amongst ourselves, and then open to the floor so you can hopefully get some good learnings out of what we're going to try to do here today. Um, what I also want to tell you is that we were bonding last night in uh, the warehouse district. We got home at a relatively decent hour, and but in the middle of our dinner, there was all this commotion and activity because there was a filming going on of a new movie with Josh Jamel, Fergie's husband, Las Vegas, some of those shows. Cute guy, good looking guy, right? Um, anyway, the bottom line is we didn't see him. We didn't see him and we didn't, <laughs> we didn't um, but we toasted to him because it was supposed to be a motorcycle scene which we never got to see but we saw all the prep. So it was a pretty cool night in New Orleans. So that's our panel, and I'm going to begin because we're on a tight time schedule. And that's how we're going to begin. So you heard Cece open the panel, who's a colleague of mine, and um, the two physicians from Intel and Mini Clinic that uh, spoke with her. And you start to get the sense, and you're feeling it every day in your businesses, that there's this new health economy taking shape and form as a result of the Affordable Care Act. So when the new, how does that affect you, and how does that affect the world that we're operating within? So, I'm just going to let this go away. So um, I, look at, I look at it in a couple of ways, that um, the government is playing a bigger role which I know you're probably saying, um, a bigger role? How much more can they play? But it is playing a bigger role in the design and development of the whole strategy around 
this new health economy and the creation of value-based care. You also, I think, heard on Monday that the, the secretary would like to see Medicare move to about 80 to 90 percent of providers being in value-based care relationships as a Medicare payment strategy. We'll talk a little about what that might mean. And in that quest for value, it's leading to the need to document and make sure that you have the analytics to not only manage effectively within that kind of environment, but also to um, be able to report the, that data because a lot of new payment models are tied to the ability to produce quality. Um, that, that's a big deal. And I, I think you also sensed on Monday the rise of consumerism. Well, it's not just um, I, I have a story that I would add to that, pre that, that context. The con rise of consumerism is becoming much more, people are becoming much more educated as they buy products, whether it's on the exchange or they have options through their workplace or they're aging into Medicare or they're coming off of Medicaid and having choices or going on to Medicaid and having choices. So the more, it, you know, the, the more they become intelligent about choices, the more we have to react to that. Reacting is as easy as the doctor from mini clinic said that instead of taking an hour off of work when you're getting paid by the hour to stop at a CVS on the way home from work because you think you have a cold or you, or maybe it is the flu and you want to kind of get on the right meds real quick, is a very convenient thing to do. And our studies are demonstrating that convenience is a primary cho choice maker now for people. And their health plans and their options have to be part of that process. So they're gonna make wiser decisions. Mobile devices are part of that. The relationship between mobile devices and access to physicians is, incre is happening, you know that. And, they're part, and they wanna be part of that. So uh, with all of the, that being said, this is leading to this tremendous rise of new entrants into the whole space of healthcare now. So I think it was Fortune 50 companies, 17 had some relationship to healthcare in their products or design. And in our data, we're seeing now that all 50, including automotive companies, are playing some role or experimenting in healthcare as a result of health reform. So health reform, <clears throat> after being a real big part of that whole effort in Washington, watching it evolve daily, um, has really ignited the engines of, of change, the catalyst, if you will, of this transformation. I think what's different between now and the 90s is it's in statute and it doesn't seem that it's gonna go back because we're adapting to it and accepting it. So with all of that said, there are many states that are um, a part of the process. So what are they doing? It's easy for a state or it's easy for a payer to move towards the concept of a defined contribution. I will pay a certain dollar amount for somebody's care or you as a consumer will know what that dollar amount is and then you will select choices around that. You've heard about this idea for a while. Well, in Medicaid, and like Medicare Advantage on the Medicare side, much of the payment is now a capitated payment to managed care organizations from the states directly, and then the states contract with providers like yourselves. This isn't an, a good or a bad, it's a reality based on budgetary constraints within the states. Jeff will tell you more about this from his overview and perspective, but what's telling about this change is that the people that are being subcontracted to the Chads and the Mikes are looking for these innovative partnerships with providers where the dollars at play are both at risk and perceived to be in a partnership relationship more than to be just, um, here, I'm gonna negotiate a fee schedule with you and that's what I'm paying off of. So that transformation, I know you're sensing and you're feeling, but our mission is to help you understand that and what to think about. The numbers are daunting. I mean, 
you, you see what the numbers look like in these states that have expanded, and you see what they look like in non-expansion states, but the truth is all Medicaid has expanded to maybe nine million plus lives last year because even if people didn't qualify for the exchange, they might have not qualified for Medicaid, and that put it into a different perspective. This kind of gives you a sense of the dollars involved. It's now a bigger program than Medicare, which when I was young and starting out in this, Medicare was always the dominant payer in terms of government programs. But if you look totally at Medicare and Medicaid against the $2.8 trillion overall spend on healthcare in the country, Medicare and Medicaid and TRICARE and VA, VNA and, I mean, VA and, and Department of Defense dollars all together equal at least half of that spend right now. So it's a significant force in creating transformation because of all the money that's being spent through government organizations. And I can tell you even the VA, through the troubles they've had, and the Department of Defense are working with folks like us to figure out how it's working in the private sector and then trying to apply it even in their models. Um, this gives you a sense of what states, how many states are moving in this trend towards paying flat fees to Medicare, med to Medicaid health plans for their Medicaid populations. And the unique part of this is also that many of these populations are the more challenging populations beyond just moms and kids anymore. So whether it's ABD, whether it's long-term care or behavioral health, all the challenging populations are now moving into capitated relationships. For you in long-term care and for behavioral health issues, you know them so well because so many of your patients are challenged by these issues. You can be a solution and everybody's looking for those solutions. So it's not to fear, it's to embrace, I believe, and the opportunity to do so, it, the door is wide open right now. So if you know what you do really well and you can document that on both quality metrics and financial metrics, if you can bring that to organizations that are accepting the full risk, there's value in that for you. And we argue that maybe you need to be thinking about that as a strategy. Um, moving forward, these are the maps are great, and these are, these are the states that are doing uh, various things in long-term care. So managed long-term care has become a critical component of the overall strategy for the states and for uh, CMS. So whether it's in the pilot programs that combine Medicare and Medicaid funding, or whether it's in waiver programs, this has now become pretty routine throughout the states, over half of them are involved in some level and more than half, it'll be more than half after 2015 waivers are finished and move forward. So it's something to be watching and something to be proactive in the design of the waiver at your Medicaid director's office. If you don't know your Medicaid director, I would advise that you get to know that person because you will be part of it. This kind of breaks down what the um, market looks like in terms of providers and plans in the Medicaid market and the challenges that they are facing. So dual eligibles are Medicare, Medicaid beneficiary, beneficiaries, 10.7 million people, and the spend is about $380 million, billion, $380 billion. Big numbers for a small percentage of the population, mostly not in managed care by choice. Many are now moving into managed care because the states are creating non-voluntary, they can opt out, but they're being introduced into managed care. So again, a population you know well, multiple morbidities, and you, you are dealing with these folks at home on whether it's depression and CHF, or it's depression, CHF, and COPD. I mean, you know these issues, and you can play a huge role in helping people with this. Long-term care, we've talked about, the margins in the industry are shrinking at, think about this, that states are calculating actuarially the value of their spend for these populations, then subcontracting to health plans 
to take on the responsibility of treating them. So there's a dollar amount, and what they can do is go back to their state budgets, and they have predictability now. And you all know in business, predictability is, is key to success at some level. So what they're doing by this public policy effort is to create predictability in their in the line item that they have least control over in a fee-for-service environment, and that's in Medicaid. So by contracting with plans, they're fixing that amount, but remember that dollar amount going to the plans isn't an open checkbook. They have to be stewards of that money and they have to be very careful of how that money is spent as well. So when you're negotiating with them, you have to kind of sit in their seat for a moment to understand how the state actually calculated the home health spend, let's say, or what home health can do for these populations that people are taking care of now, show them, document them, and as a result of that, come up with a win-win strategy as opposed to they win, you lose, you lose, they win, whatever. Um, and the models of delivery are clearly under change. The transformation is real. These are the populations and the things in the marketplace that are causing that to happen. It's um, new entrants are coming in, whether it's um, Intel or whether it's um, uh, Google or Apple with apps or whether it's Walgreens with their clinics or CVS with their clinics, everything is up for grabs in terms of the dollars because you see that there's so much money involved, 2.9 trillion, how, who can grab what and that is taking place. An example could be if you drive the beltway around Washington DC where Jeff and I live and Tracy lives, um, you can see that the defense companies who have been in this space for a long time are now um, moving into healthcare analytics and data and contracting with CMS when they might have been working only with Department of Defense before that. So everybody's jumping involved in some way, shape, or form. This is um, a complicated story of how to get this transformation from step one to step two to step three. So I, I think you'll have access to these slides and you can kind of review them on your own and with your teams. But I think my message is that I'm running around the country working with all kinds of organizations, payers, providers, and every combination thereof, which there are lots of these new combinations now. And nobody has the answers. People are now taking risk when they never understood risk before. Capitation is real now versus in the 90s when it was a passing fad maybe. But it looks like the train has absolutely left the station and this is gonna continue and this trend is real. I urge you to figure out strategically what you do really well and then package it and talk to the plans in your area and see how this can be, don't fear it, embrace it and see how it could be a new revenue source and vehicle for you in a creative partnership. Because I think that's, that's where we're at and that's kind of the challenge in front for everybody. So it's kind of like Pogo, remember Pogo? If anybody my age could remember, Pogo was a little comic strip and remember the telling thing he ever said, I never am a comic strip guy. There is somebody on the panel who is. Um, but you'll, he used to say, if you're not part of the problem, you're part of, if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. Well, I think this is the opportunity to be part of the solution and embrace it because it's, it's right in front of you. So with that said, I'm gonna turn over because I did finish in my time allotted and I'll come back to you with questions. I'm gonna turn over to my dear friend, Jeff, uh, and he's gonna kind of give you a big pers perspective. Well, thank you, Gary, and I appreciate the opportunity to chat with you today. Uh, when uh, you, as you all know, you have a wonderful CEO and when she invited me to come to New Orleans, uh, I was absolutely excited because of how important you all are to uh, the Medicaid plans that I represent. I didn't really realize how much until I was getting ready to leave for New Orleans. I got a phone call from one of my CEOs who uh, wanted to know uh, if I could come up to New Jersey because we were having a little issue up there. And I said, no, I can't go down. I have to go down to New Orleans uh, to talk to uh, DNAA's annual meeting. And there was a pause for a second and she said, DNAA's annual meeting, that's that's the visiting nurses, the home health folks, right? I said, yeah. 
long pause because she knows that I'm a little aggressive occasionally, and she says, Jeff, be nice to them. We really need their help. So uh, uh, for those of you who don't know, um, Medicaid, Medicaid directors generally refer to CMS as the Emerald City because, like Oz, it says a lot of stuff, but the stuff is actually happening in the state, and that's what I want to talk to you about today. Uh, we're trying to move from this. For the folks in the back row who can't see it, it's two dogs sitting and talking, and the, the one dog says to the other dog, service dogs do what they're told, and they don't expect a biscuit. I'm more of a fee-for-service dog. Well, those fee-for-service days are over. Uh, that is the truth. It is going away, and our plans need to find ways to manage to this, which is, for those in the very back, uh, you've got a rare condition called good health, and frankly, we're not sure how to treat it. Uh, the only way the plans are going to survive is to get to this model, and the only way that they can do it is help, with, uh, help by the providers to help drive this change, because we really have an enormous growth opportunity. When people think of Medicaid, they think about that big circle of Medicaid. It isn't. It's actually a lot of distinct populations, and you all know this very well. Our plans are struggling because there are 12.1 million new Medicaid beneficiaries this year alone. 400,000 of them came from fee-for-service. There's a 400,000 person shrinkage in fee-for-service. So even the best design networks are going to have a little stress. When you think about managed Medicaid, the first thing that comes to mind are those folks, women and children. Uh, we do that really well. Many of you don't know this, but I'll tell you an interesting fact. Half of the births in the United States are paid for by Medicaid. 90% of them are in captated risk plans. Why? Because giving a pregnant woman a card and saying, hey, good luck finding a doc probably is not the best way to provide care. But Medicaid is expanding, and it isn't just the standard expansion, it's the dual eligibles. These are the numbers that are going to drive change in the near future. All of you know that uh, my former employer was the nursing home. Uh, when people say, oh, nursing homes get paid by the federal government, that's Medicare. Uh, well, no. A Medicaid actually pays for the services, as you know, in institutional care, and that change is going to have a dramatic impact on the Medicaid plans as they begin to receive capitated payments for duals like these aged folks here. This is the thing everyone talks about. Oh, the expansion population. Men that made under 100% of poverty are now in. It turns out they are excessive users because they haven't seen doctors in a long time. So there's a lot of behavioral health issues, as all of you know. That is a challenge that our plans are trying to manage right now, but luckily we're getting 100% reimbursement from the feds. As you know, that's not going to last forever, and that's going to cause uh, margin compression and cause us to focus a little bit, a little bit harder. This is the last one, and this is the big one. The IBDD population, the folks that you deal with so well, the ones that our plans say, oh, I can handle that, because the cost of that individual for Medicare and Medicaid is $108,000 a year. The insurance plans say, of course I can manage that. It's $108,000. I can cut costs on that. I can provide better care, and I absolutely am here to tell you that I absolutely believe our plans can. The challenge they're having is they've never really done that before, and it turns out that $108,000 is not just a lot of wasted money. These folks are really expensive. And so we need to think about new models where we can generate savings and provide better care, and that's what we're committed to doing. So where are the uh, future opportunities? Where are the blue light specials that are going to really start to drive savings? Well, I would suggest to you that there are six of them. Pharmaceutical management, uh, that is a big deal for us. Drugs, as you know, are very expensive, and it's not just the high-priced drugs like Sovaldi where uh, half the U.S. population with hep C resides in Medicaid population. It's also folks like diabetics. It turns out drug companies, my former employer, have raised the price of, of insulin quite dramatically. Uh, so someone that can manage that is going to be a winner in this new model. Uh, mental health. All of you are aware that Medicaid beneficiaries have higher rates of SMI, substance abuse, and other behavioral health issues than the general population. Our plans are struggling with this right now. In the expansion population, in the aged dual population where you're having dementia, our plans are trying to figure out what is the best way to handle this and reduce cost at the same time, and you all are going to be key to that. Mobility services. I did not realize this uh, till just recently, that somewhere between 12 and 15 percent of all Medicaid spend is driving people away. That's a big deal, and that is going to see major compression and the folks that can answer that are going to save a lot of money. Where are the other opportunities? We heard the folks from Intel saying, 
I've got all these great ideas, and I talked to some of you. Uh, they were great ideas, but a few of you said, yes, but the financial model doesn't really work that way. Uh, you're right, but it ultimately will. And so I believe that reaching out and doing digital contact and outreach and telehealth are going to be dramatic changes that the Medicaid plans are going to implement to help drive good services. I left this in for last because I'm talking to the home health folks, but this is the thing that's most important. The truth is our plans that are in getting into the dual eligible space face, as all of you know, a mandate from the states to get folks out of institutional care. Turns out that's really expensive. And HCBS says that those individuals should have a choice. Well, the plans are trying to figure out how to do that the best. They can't do it without your help. And you have an opportunity to meet with the plans and put them on a path that provides better care at less cost. And that's why this is gonna be such a big deal over the next couple of years. But where are the keys to success? As Gary mentioned, there are three, and I would like you all to focus on them because this is, when I put on the guys who pay my, my paycheck, the problems we have. The first is in measurement. Uh, data is key. Data is the reason that payers pay. Uh, our customers are the state Medicaid directors. They want to see data. And I'm encouraging you strongly to do everything you can to get good data. I heard GNRA is doing a new data uh, uh, algorithm project uh, that I heard at the session beforehand. I would encourage you to support that because it's going to be a huge deal. Beneficiary support. We, have, we get graded on HEDA scores. How do the beneficiaries like care? Uh, I know there's some debate. I would suggest to you as a former nursing home guy that it would be valuable for home health agencies to have a US-based, federally-based uh, accreditation standard. It helps plans reach their HEDA scores when you've been accredited and ultimately would be, I believe, better for the industry and certainly better for the plan because this is the big thing, quality. We cannot get paid if we don't start showing quality and there's going to be a lot of debate over the next couple of years, is capitated plans the best way to go? I would argue that it's yes and for a lot of reasons and the quality is gonna drive that. Let me end with this. Uh, everyone talks about insurance, we're all worried about margins, I understand that, I'm an MBA, I love the finance aspect of it. But I also joined this organization because of this. This is what it is about. The woman on my right uh, is alone. She can't do things. She's institutional. The uh, young man in this picture is at home. He's doing the things that he wants to do to make care for himself better. That is what our plans are committed to, and I hope you can help our plans get there. I want to turn it over now to uh, one of the plans of MHPA, uh, Michael Monson, who represents Centene, uh, who's going to talk to you a little bit uh, more in depth about some of the things you can do to help us. Michael. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm thrilled to be here. Um, I, I am working at Centene now, and I'll tell you a little bit more about Centene in a couple minutes, but I did want to let you know also that this is a bit of a homecoming for me because I actually spent uh, the better part of the last decade working at the Visiting Nurse Service of New York, uh, leading strategy and innovation. So uh, I actually have sat in that chair before, understand exactly what you're doing, understand exactly the challenges that you face, and understand the opportunities that you have. Um, and I'm a big supporter uh, and think that, that VNAs and home health in general have a real opportunity to, to really make a difference as we move forward. Um, so Centene, for all of you who don't know, there's been some mentions of Centene, but let me give you a little more background. We are a Fortune 500 company. Uh, we will end this year with approximately 20 billion in revenue based on the guidance we've been giving. Um, we operate in 21 states. We predominantly started as a, a Medicaid a plan focused on the, the moms and babies. Uh, then we've moved into ABD and we've also moved uh, quite rapidly into the LTSS services uh, and also duals. Um, we operate uh, managed long-term services and supports programs in six states. Uh, we have another state that we've already been awarded in, New Hampshire, uh, that we'll be launching, and there's several more that are coming. There's an, R there's an RFP already out for Iowa right now, uh, and several others are coming down the pike. So this is, as was mentioned earlier, something that is coming. Um, we also have responsibility, uh, I also have responsibility not only for our LCSS programs, but for our financial alignment demonstration, the dual demos that came out of the ACA. So we have that in five states as well. Um, so this is a space that we care about, this is a space that we know about, um, and this is a space that we need help in. Um, one of the things that uh, has been mentioned here today, but I, 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 I want to emphasize it because I think it's critical for you all to know, um, is that the ambulance is on the way. 
the red lights and the blue lights are flashing because fee-for-service is dead. Um, you can eke out a couple more years on it, on both the Medicare side and the Medicaid side, but if you continue to think that that's what your business is going to be, you won't have a business anymore. Um, it is critical for you to understand that the world has changed. Medicare Advantage is growing at a rapid pace. It's been growing. I don't have to tell you this. You know this, but it's going to continue to grow. Um, now with CMS having come out, as, as Gary mentioned earlier, they've been very clear that there will be risk-based models. 80 to 90 percent of all payments on fee-for-service will be going through risk-based models. Now, that's not all going to be capitation. There'll be capitation components. There'll be bundles, the bundles that you probably all are aware of at this juncture. You'll have uh, the financial alignment demonstrations, um, shared savings programs that are coming through as the ACOs. All of these are going to directly impact uh, you all and are going to change the way that you need to think about your business model. Um, and finally, as was just mentioned, Medicaid MLTS is coming. Uh, it is, uh, so for those of you who have large Medicaid programs um, and that you've been billing fee for service on those, those programs are really going away. Um, those programs are going to be transformed. Um, there's still always going to be a need for PCA services uh, and basic skilled services, uh, but looking at new innovative ways of delivering those services will be critical in new ways of paying for those services. So the good news here is that you are uniquely positioned to take advantage of these changes. Um, you already serve the hardest populations. You already know them, you understand them, and I will tell you that this is something that health plans are still coming up to speed on. This is something they're still realizing what really takes to, to uh, service these populations appropriately. Most importantly, you own the distribution channel, and by that I mean you actually deliver care into the home. That last mile is a critical, critical component. Um, you know, it's very interesting. I got to Centene and, um, you know, I more of a provider perspective, even though at BNS we had a, a plan as well. Um, and there was talk about people going off of case management and all these people would go off of case management. I, I looked at my peers and I said, why would anyone go off case management? Um, you know, this, this, is, this is critical for us to care for people. And it's because in this other world, in this com the commercial world, in the, the, the moms and babies world, people do go on and off case management. Obviously not in this world. This is a world in the Medicaid plans, and the MLTSS programs, no one goes off case management. And we need eyes and ears out in the homes. We need people to be able to go and tell us what's in that brown bag, right? Stuff that you're already doing. What is going on? What is the, what is the condition of the home? Is it infested with roaches? The member has asthma or COPD. That's a problem. We need to get pest service control in there. Um, we won't know that. Uh, we'll know that because we dispatch our own care managers into the homes. But your services will be in the homes on a much more regular basis. And we'll have the opportunity to share information with us to be able to improve the lives of our members. And there's been talk of data. And I do think it's really important to note um, that post-acute care has the best data sets in all of health services. Um, I know everyone uh, has bemoaned OASIS and the length of time it takes to fill out the OASIS. And for those in the nursing homes, the length of time it takes to fill out the MDS. But the reality is you now have a decade or more of data that allow you to demonstrate what your actual results are. And we do want to see those results. And that quality, the ability to say what has been the change in rehospitalization rates, what's been the change in ED utilization, what's been the change in falls, the change in urinary incontinence, um, the ability to demonstrate quality of life measures as well as actual quality outcomes that uh, impact the bottom line are really critical. What you do need to be prepared for, though, is to think about how you will bear risk. Because the new models will, entitle, will, will, will require you to be thinking about not just taking a payment, but taking a payment based on an outcome. Now, some of those risk models will be upside and downside risk. So the ability to share in savings and then also potentially pay a penalty if you don't share in those savings. Uh, more of those models will probably in the earlier days that you'll see will be more bonuses or quality withholds saying, I'll pay you your, your, your fee-for-service rate or I'll pay you a negotiated rate. And by the way, we do pay on HERDs. Um, uh, but we're going to hold some money back to make sure that you meet the quality measures that we agree to. This is what the world is going to start to look like. So you need to start to think about how you're going to implement the cash flow around that and your care models around that and your systems around that because that is where we're going to be moving towards. Now, what are the types of things um, that, that we would be interested in? Um, they're things you're already doing, right? That's the great news. You just need to repackage them a little bit, work with plans like ours to think about how you can repackage that, um, and, and we can come up with payment models around it. Transitional care, especially the Coleman model. We all know there's transitional care, and, and, and wherever we have full capitation, 
And this is important for you to think about as you work with your plans. The difference, well, you need to understand what their capitation looks like. So there's the full capitation where you have both the LTSS services that you would be familiar with as well as all the acute services and the post-acute services. If we don't have the full capitation, there are different things that we can do. And we have partial capitation. It means it gives us a little less, it gives, there's fewer dollars to work with and fewer things that we can impact that will create savings. Because obviously we all know that much of what you do reduces ED and hospital admissions. But transitional care programs, especially in full capitation, uh, are definitely programs that you want to be thinking about how you work with plans around. Hospital at home. Take a look at the work that Bruce Leff has done out of Hopkins. This is groundbreaking work. This is work that you all can do. There can be programs that you partner with hospitals, that you can partner with plans or third parties together in terms of ED diversion and thinking about how you take medical cases that uh, do not require an observation stay, especially if the hospital's full and they don't want those patients anyway, right? We all know the hospitals want the surgical cases, they don't want, and the cancer cases, they don't want the medical cases, the CHFs, the COPDs. There's no reason why we couldn't have someone who needs to be diureased, be diureased potentially in their home, if you've got the right high-tech nurses that can go in, or certainly in partnership with the nursing home. Maybe they take a two-day stop to be diureased in a nursing home, and you, joint, you do a joint with the nursing home in terms of taking a DRG. And we would pay you on a DRG. So that's the hospital payment. We would pay you on a DRG. It would be a less DRG than we pay the hospital, but we would save money, better for the patient, better for you. So that's the one to think about. Um, I'll leave you with a couple more. Fall prevention, uh, clearly this is something you do all day long right now, especially, again, uh, this is true, I think, for both partial capitation and full capitation. Falls are deadly. I don't need to tell you all that. Um, and falls lead to hospitalizations. Hospitalizations lead to not only uh, potentially worse outcomes for a patient um, in terms of other, other, other diagnoses that they might potentially might uh, acquire uh, in the hospital or deteriorate in the hospital, but then often they end up back in a nursing home for a post-acute stay, and you all know that many of those patients end up getting stuck in nursing homes. And for those of us who are uh, receiving a capitation for the LTSS services, someone who goes to a nursing home is bad for us because it's bad for the member. Let's just start there. We want members to live in the least restrictive setting that's most appropriate for them. But financially, it's bad for us as well. Um, thinking about looking at our members that you're caring for on the custodial basis, um, using your PCAs to help us identify deterioration so we can stop it before it happens. Again, to stop a hospitalization or stop a nursing home stay. Anybody who ends up in a nursing home, we want to avoid that. And if there are programs that you can think about that you could do that are on a custodial basis for long-term needs, and I'm, I'm not talking about post-acute now, um, those are interesting. And then finally, what I would say is think about how you might be able to work with nursing homes that you already partner with, to partner with them to think about how you can repatriate people from nursing homes into the community. There's a lot of people being warehoused in nursing homes right now. Um, and some of that is just because no one knows how to get them back into the community. So that's something we are very focused on in thinking about how to get people back into the community. But that means we need help finding housing. That means we need help doing the transition. That means we need help just even identifying who potentially is appropriate. These are all areas that you all can pay, play a part in. These are all areas where you guys can lead on. Um, and I think that this is a great opportunity uh, for you all who are already serving these very challenging populations, who know these populations well, and plans are eager, and we are eager to work with you to do that. Thank you. So thank you. Oh, I forgot to introduce Thanks. All right, well, thank you. We've had a great uh, set of presentations. You are a great association. Key work that you do. You have a great leader. Um, and for those that are still here in the last session of the last speaker, you guys are the champs. You guys need to get a gold star. I'm sure Tracy's got some great uh, prizes for you, right? <laughs> so um, again, my name is Chad Westover. Um, I was asked to, to present today when I was still with Molina Healthcare. Uh, before Molina Healthcare, I was with uh, WellPoint, Anthem. Um, and uh, for some reason, I still um, was asked to, to present. Uh, I'm now with the University of Utah uh, Health Plans. They just um, created a new position there. So um, I will give you some background from, from all perspectives. So the health plans, as you've heard already, the health plans are moving in a new direction. Um, if they're not there now, they're, they're lagging behind. But population health management is a key principle of what health plans are doing. And within that, and you've seen, you've seen a lot of this already, but to, to, to get clinical integrated networks together is going to be very key. To really understand 
from a payer side and a provider side how the world looks is going to be key in order to align those incentives. Uh, I, I did learn a new uh, term. Uh, I haven't heard this before. I don't know if any of our panel have heard it. A payvider. Has anybody heard that before? I just heard that. Payvider, a payer and a provider. So we're even coming up with new words to put in the dictionary. But that is part of where we're all going so that we can all align <coughs> our incentives. And when, when our incentives are aligned and the payer is capitated, guess what? We would love to bring other people with us to share in that risk. Okay, that's, and that's where you've heard a lot today. But focusing on care management, on the care management model, this is where I think of the population health management of where you all can play a very, very critical role. So some of the activities, like what, what are being, what's being requested of, of the payers out there, the, those that you contract with? Well, we're asked to do medical record review, reviews, patient outreach. We've got to get out to the patients. You've heard a lot of that. Very critical. Uh, the members that are out there, uh, what are their conditions? What are the socioeconomic conditions? What's causing them to go to the ED? Uh, and we have care managers that are out there that try to assess this as well, but if you are there on the front lines and have a better, more consistent uh, interaction with these members, you're frankly in a better spot uh, than even some of the care managers are. Um, but managing this high-risk population, um, trying to reduce the readmissions, the ED visits, unnecessary care, um, very, very critical for us. And we, you know, we buy all sorts of software, predictive modeling. We buy, um, you know, I had an ambulance service come and talk to us. Uh, you know, there's a lot of ideas out there, out there about a, how to maintain good health and how to care for those that are chronically ill. Um, you can provide a great assistance uh, in that. When I was with Molina, we were in discussions, and it, it didn't conclude what, uh, when I left, so maybe they have, but they were in discussions with CNS uh, to come up with a shared savings model. Now that, that hasn't, from my knowledge, come to fruition, but if you can think about a shared savings model, much like I think what Michael was talking about, with a payer, how can you both align your incentives? How can you be on the same page as, uh, as the payer? And when you're both on the same page and those incentives are in aligned, uh, you know, great things can happen in a long-term relationship. So um, the slide didn't, wasn't created exactly how I had imagined with the health plan as that big, huge uh, bubble, but it did remind me of a joke that I heard. Um, for those that know a teenager, have had a teenager, um, how many uh, teenagers does it take to screw in a light bulb? And it, it, of course, is just one. All they do is they hold it, and the world revolves around them. <laughs> and that's probably what you think about health plans. That's why this slide reminded me. I was like, oh, my goodness, I'm getting ready to show this slide, and it's this big health plan and all the other little small circles. But I thought, you know, I'm going to keep it there because it probably reinforces what you, what you think, uh, maybe, about uh, how health plans think of themselves. Um, but it's not the intent. In fact, it, I think it brings up a good point, is that we do need to see ourselves as more equal partners in what we're trying to, to accomplish. Um, a lot of the health plans are the drivers. They may have the contracts, and, and you may be a subcontractor, if you will, but, but there are a lot of things that, if presented with a good business plan, those bubbles would be far more equal than they are right now. But, this is this the collaborative, the home health collaborative model that, that, that we've used. Many plans would use something similar. You do have the, the, the health plan that tries to bring together all the elements. Uh, a home health agency, for example, you're representing the patient. You know the patient well, as I talked about. You're able to identify changes in patient behavior. Um, one, of the, one of the things, I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit, but I don't want to miss this point. One of, one of the things that's coming into um, more and more importance in, in the data field is the coding. And so in the Medicare and Medicaid, with the risk adjustment, uh, a lot of it is based on diagnosis. If, if you have a member that is just a, a regular, not a high-risk member, or, or maybe doesn't have a diagnosis, it could mean thousands of dollars a month difference. 
uh, in the Medicaid, ex in, the, in the individual exchange, 45-year-old, uh, silver plan with a high-risk condition, the health plan's getting paid over $9,000 a month. That same person with no conditions is a few hundred dollars. Huge difference. So the point is, is that if you do notice and you do can identify for a health plan some of those diagnoses that are not coded in, in, the, in the medical plan, you can add tremendous value by you know, identifying that and having, uh, you know, making sure the physician then goes and follows up and, and makes that, and you can work with the health plan to make sure that happens. But that's another added value that more and more as, as the populations or, or the health plans are being risk adjusted, and it's a zero sum game, you just have to code correctly, uh, it becomes very, very important. Then you've got a CMO representing on the physician side. You've got the care managers, again, from the, from the health plan patient perspective. And then you have what we would call a community connector, someone that's out in the community uh, looking for uh, different avenues of uh, ways to help uh, provide services that are, that are eligible in the community. Uh, heating, for example, for those that uh, uh, qualify for heating assistance. Okay, and I, I see that I do need to move on a little bit. So here's the care management model, patient, uh, patient coordination, transition of care, some things that you certainly would be able to help with, registries, um, preventive care, um, and then self-management skills. So again, with the constant communication that you have with the members, I think that's far more important. Here's a graph that shows once the University of Utah started to implement these care coordination models, what it did to the overall cost with the, um, uh, with the home health uh, costs. So as you can see here, overall costs go down, some bumps, there's a family that has a declining cost as well, and then the family too that has lower costs. This really helps to identify as you get more and more granular, as you get more and more, this isn't acuity adjusted, so these families, I don't know if, if they have the same conditions or not, so it's just an overall guide to show how if, as you get more and more collaborative in this model, you can really bring down the cost. The point is, hey, should the health plans just benefit entirely? Or if you have uh, helped achieve that uh, reduction, I mean, if I were you, I would go to the table and say, hey, let's talk. We can help, we can help and we can get aligned uh, more. So this is, this is a graph, it's a histogram that a health plan would look at, okay? So if you're sitting in a health plan meeting, they would pull out a graph that looks something like this, right? It's completely evident exactly what this means for everyone, right? All you need to see is this, we can move on. Really, the only thing you need to see is this is more of the professional uh, cost, fairly stable, uh, readmissions a little bit, but the green uh, is the SNF cost, the skilled nursing cost, and that's home health agency in the yellow, okay? so. A lot of, and these are episodes of care. This is all just for, just as an example, um, major joint replacement. So knees, basically, and, and these are 201 cases. What we look at that and we would say, hmm, what's really costing a lot of dollars for the health plan is the SNF. What can you do to put more yellow, less green? Okay, maybe I should have reversed the colors. You green, they're yellow. Um, but, but provides uh, more, more opportunity. So as, as you've heard so far, healthcare scrum, anybody that knows rugby, start out, get in lock arms and you battle and you see where, uh, where you can push the other side. This is what healthcare really used to be. And this is what at times when you negotiate with a health plan, it feels like. You're one, one side's winning, the other side's losing. The volume goes up, yay, we win. Health plans lose. Volumes goes down, hey, health plans wins, you lose. That can't sustain itself because we are already at a point in our healthcare where the costs just continue to go up. So the fee-for-service model, as you heard again and again, and I'll add my voice to it, cannot uh, uh, maintain itself. In uh, GDP right now for healthcare costs is around 18%. As I remember, that's when managed care back in the late 70s, 90, uh, late, late 70s, early 80s, that's when it started. It's when that was the tipping point, when the, the cost got to be so close to 20% of GDP 
no way you can sustain it. We have to do something. Um, so I need to move on a bit. Um, here's some barriers. Um, I wanted to just highlight um, a few of them. Some, you know, off time, this is on us. This is, a lot of this is on us. We need to work together. Lack of trust. We do need to make sure that we get trust. You're painted with a broad brush. And this broad brush, sometimes you get tagged with the same, you know, with, with other agencies, for-profit agencies that have got their hand in the cookie jar, so to speak, and billions and billions lost. Um, we need to build that trust. And then I have some slide about developing the trust. We talked about data, as you can prove it, show it. Uh, great line, that, a quote that I've always heard and that I use, in God we trust, all others bring data. So, so as you go and negotiate, bring data. Uh, have them, help them understand how you can be that partner and then communicate with them. Make sure that what you see, if you see those diagnoses, you get that information back and you have a, a, a reporting tool and ability to do that. Um, trust, teamwork, we can all work better. And then at the end, I just wanted to quote John F. Kennedy. The Chinese use two brush strokes to write the word crisis. One brush stroke stands for danger, the other for opportunity. In a crisis, beware of danger, but recognize the opportunity. Fortunately, JFK was wrong. The second, the uh, first danger is, is true, but, but the opportunity actually means impending doom. <laughs> so I don't want to leave with impending doom. If you want to hold on to fee-for-service, maybe that is the, 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 the angle we're going down. But a lot, of, a lot of the linguists have said, no, JFK, actually, that was not right. That wasn't the correct translation. Um, but maybe we can leave with Bono. Bono says opportunity and optimism detached from action is just a dream. So hopefully we can make this uh, a collaboration so that we can uh, have success. I really, I, I admire what you do, and I admire how you do it. And uh, the people that do it well are benefited greatly, them and their families. So thank you very much. Let me, let me do this. We have 15 minutes. We have things we want to talk about, but let, let's go to the audience first, maybe, which is off script. But I think, do you have any questions you would like to ask the panel? We have mics available, and we can be pretty quick. If not, I can start that process. Why don't you think about that? Oh, you have one? Go ahead. Just go up. Go away. Thanks, this has been such an interesting panel and I, I really appreciate it. My name is Teresa Lee, I'm with the Alliance for Home Health Quality and Innovation. And one question I have is, you know, it just seems like from the payer standpoint, of course there's interest in aligning incentives. I think there's also, at least I'm also noticing a trend toward uh, payers purchasing providers. So I'm thinking of, you know, Medicare Advantage and, you know, Humana, you know, which now has an entire division called Humana at Home that I think they had acquired Senior Bridge. Anyway, I'm interested in just sort of hearing about, you know, what your perspective is on the strategy there. You know, do you think that you'll continue to contract or, you know, just work with providers as partners or are you all thinking that, that's really a trend for the future and that, you know, there might be more of that sort of Kaiser type model that's fully integrated from the payer's perspective. So, so I'll start. Uh, there's, I have a lot of clients in this, in that box and strategically they're wrestling with that, that very issue. What should they own? And if they own it, do they control it more in terms of cost? And generally the answer to that question is maybe Maybe not, depends on the circumstance. I think the biggest challenge is the, the largest rise in Medicare Advantage, as you bring it up, of new health plans has been in provider-sponsored plans. So these are local provider, health system, physician organizations that have come together and create health plans to service that population. What they tend to forget most, well, a lot of the times, in my experience, 
is that you're going into the insurance business, which means risk-based capital, which means regula regulatory environment controlled by the Department of Insurance, and that if you do lose money, especially in those early years, it goes to your P&L as a system. And if you're out there in the bond market for cheaper money to build new facilities or acquire hospitals, if you're a hospital system, it could affect your ratings. So there's lots of challenges, but the model is alive and well. Um, who gets into it? Um, is anybody's guess in it? I think a lot of people jump because they thought they could control more of the dollars. And a lot of consultants have run around the country saying, if you can manage in an ACO environment, you might as well go all the way to MA as an example. The truth is, that's a quantum leap in terms of the regulatory and the Department of Insurance environment and managing risk. Managing risk is usually understated and most people tend to be challenged by that from the provider world. Comments, you guys? I mean, what I would say is that I think, you know, each plan is gonna approach it differently. I mean, you mentioned Humana, even if you look at Humana, they can't buy all the home care agencies that they need. They wanna be able to have enough capacity to deliver care uh, to the members that they want to deliver care to. And so, and I, and I think that um, while, you know, we, and we've made some acquisitions uh, provider delivery uh, as well, but not, not on the scale of, of Humana. But what I would say is that there, I can't imagine a world in which uh, national payers are gonna be able to have national providers that they own, right? Um, that will service all of their needs. Um, and there's always going to be a need for provider networks uh, out, and, out and beyond uh, what is within the, within the confines of a vertically integrated system. And I think that's true, actually, for plan, uh, providers who go to provider-based plans will have the same challenge. Right. Um, now suddenly they realize that they have to have, in order to be an MA plan, you have to have a valid network, right? <laughs> you need to meet network adequacy, which cannot just be your own provider, right? Um, so it is, uh, it's unlikely, I think, that you'll see a complete convergence uh, like a Kaiser model. I think Kaiser grew up in a very special place and special time. Um, I think you'll see various, and I think each region will probably look a little different. I, I, I would say that it's a great question because th that, that consolidation is happening. I, I come from the standalone health insurance world, and so this is my first foray, two months now, foray into the uh, integrated uh, world. And, and it does, you know, you think all the s problems would be solved by just having an integrated model. Some of them do, some of them are solved, um, but there are still other issues out there. The health plan still has to provide uh, a lot of data and a lot of information, a lot of strategy around the market as a whole. And sometimes the provider gets a little, little bit narrow, but I think that you're going to see uh, more and more of these consolidations. I, I, I really do, and I think you're gonna see them uh, on the part of the payers and the providers. I think you're gonna, you're gonna see provider, or payers start trying to look like providers and providers trying to look like payers and call themselves integrated and, and call themselves an ACO. Um, and some of them will be and some of them won't. But I, I do think, I mean, I might put my bet on an integrated model. And I think in probably five years, five to maybe 10 years, I think healthcare is gonna look very, very different than it does now. And the roles and responsibilities will be different. Very, very more, much, much more integrated. So it's interesting as well. <clears throat> free Chad at uh, University of Utah. We just say BC before Chad. <laughs> BC. Yeah. Um, I was there on a visit for, and one of the things that we were talking about was the idea of you had your own health plan. Wouldn't it be interesting to look at some bundled payment programs? that you could use your health plan as a laboratory and then you could go out into the market and contract with Michael or somebody else now that you as a provider learned how to do that within a managed environment. So all of this innovation is possible, it's exciting. I don't think I've ever been more interested and excited in the work we do. I've always told my kids to get into this world of healthcare because it's always changing but they chose not to, it's okay. It was okay. But the, the problem, I will say just one more thing about this, because it's, it's something I've thought a lot about given that I'm, I've moved career paths a bit. Everybody has to have their margin. And, and if, you're, if you're standalone, you know, the payer has to have their margin. 
the provider has to have their margin. And the question is, does, and, and all, the whole supply chain has to have their margin. And, if, and I was looking at actually some, some information uh, last night, and, or maybe it was this morning, it was pretty late last night, but um, you know, if you, if you wanna ask what the margin is for a health plan, what would you guess the margin is for a health plan? Nine, 12? More like United was four. Percent, well pointed members around three or four, Molina less than one, um, Centene probably twelve. <laughs> no, no, I don't, I don't know what your margin is, but but relatively low. But everybody has to maintain their margin. Medtronic, manufacturer, what was that? Fourteen percent. So everybody's trying to maintain their margin, and the problem if if the the the, the pie just can't continue to get bigger. That was my point. The pie cannot continue to get bigger because that puts too much squeeze on, 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 on health care. I, I saw a stat, a, a stat um, and I'll stop talking really back there. Um, by 2042, if the trends go continually, if the out-of-pocket and premium costs continue to rise as they are right now, by 2042, 100% of the average family's income will go to uh, out-of-pocket. Crazy, right? It can't happen. It won't happen. But that's the kind of pressure that everybody's under. And I think the point is, we have to figure out how to, how to rationalize those costs so it doesn't continue to get bigger. Yeah, my name is Rich Chesney. In the world of the duels, do you see the combination of the medical and long-term uh, cost structures uh, from an insurance perspective being the exception of the rule? Uh, ultimately, from my perspective, it's going to be the rule. You want one? Okay. Uh, and I think there are three reasons for that. When the, it, can you hear me now? I feel like I'm Verizon. Uh, so the financial alignment incentives have been a disaster. I mean, that's, that's just the statement of fact. Um, Melanie thought that there were going to be 2 million people in the FAIs. Uh, the FAIs just crested 330,000. Uh, passive enrollment has a lot to do with it. The FAIs that are involved uh, tend to be sicker. Uh, the population has been winnowed by uh, a number of competing forces. But ultimately, I think you have to bring them together. And I think CMS is committed to bringing them together. I would lay out to you as my fearless uh, guess that regardless of what the data says in the FAI, CMS is still going to move forward with it. Because it doesn't make sense to leave it separate and to you know, the points that have been raised about each provider having to have a margin, when you think about CMS looking at the total pie and knowing that through integration you are going to get some benefit, it's hard to determine how much, but you will get some, it seems highly unlikely to me that in a three-year window uh, after the FAIs really start reporting data that you continue to have some separation between the two. Well said. So um, if you have a question, go ahead. I'm sorry. Just a quick uh, Barbara Gage from the Brookings Institution and the Post-Acute Care Center for Research. And I, this presentation was great. I think it's important to drive home that there's a lot of change going on all over the country. So while this focused on the Medicaid piece, all of the issues that were raised and the ideas about cost shifting between the different pieces really do spread especially in the dual eligible program, between the Medicare and the Medicaid, and with this whole push towards the ACA and improving the outcomes, you're really going to see uh, openness, much more so than in the past, about innovative approaches to handle the costs of these cases. So get involved. There's a, there's a lot going on. We have a great resource, uh, PACER, the Post-Acute Care Center for Research, which a little bit of a misnomer since we've had Centene and others um, talking about some of the long-term, the LTSS populations, the home and community-based waiver populations, and the work that's going on at CMS in terms of standardizing the measurement of those populations in order to set the HCBW uh, rates. No, so. Thank I'll you. Throw, I'll throw out one thing if you all have not seen it. MedPAC and MACPAC put out a report in January uh, specifically focusing on the duals. The numbers in there are astounding. If you think about the cost of an aged dual uh, for Medicare and Medicaid, the average cost pre, uh, uh, bigger than 65 
is over $80,000. In HCBS, it's barely 52. So you see this institutional care compression really helping drive, or at least changing the curve, and that's just the aged population. The number that I quoted earlier, the 108,000, is what MACPAC and MedPAC uh, estimate for the below 65 uh, DDID population. So you've got a lot of, of uh, resources that can be reallocated to provide better care and presumably at significantly lower cost. So in this kind of environment of change, things that we're seeing are hospitals, hospital systems getting into things like population management, closing wards, closing uh, sections of the hospital, and coming back, me coming back six months later and seeing all care managers in that space, as opposed to beds. That's the, that's the revolution that's happening in the environment. So as people move to population management and learn about taking risk and thriving in that environment, I think those are the lessons that we maybe should talk about a little bit. So in terms of relationships, in terms of how you could partner with organizations like are, are in our audience, first I want to say one thing before I turn it to them. The, they are better partners, wait, let me rephrase that. They are more innovative and creative in their partnership approach than you will see out of government, in my opinion. And we work with a lot of governments as clients. But the truth is that if you want to innovate on a shared savings program, the ACO program has shown some of the limitations when you try to do something nationally. Some of the pilots have, and have done the same thing. But if you really want to innovate, go local and work a deal with your local organization because every, everything could be up on the table. So having said that, what do you got to say? Yeah, I just wanted to, and I'll try to answer your question too, too, but to get back to that, it's a really good point because the Affordable Care Act has changed the ball game. I mean, it, for insurance, it really fundamentally changed. When, in, in the commercial space, um, when you had, when your bottom line didn't work, you know, the insurance company would increase the premium, maybe change the benefit. That's, that's the re reaction to it. Now, in the Medicaid side, now, you know, I was working within the Medicaid program before Medicaid was cool. Um, and, and, you know, and it still is the same way. We can't change the benefits. We can't change the, the rates, the price. We have to use the tools, a few tools that we have to, to really population manage. So we were doing, a lot of Medicaid plans are doing this before. So that, those notions of care management, population health management, have been around in the Medicaid plans, or at least have been strongly, more, more strong uh, implemented in the, Medicaid, in the Medicaid managed care plans than they have in the commercial. But the commercial lines are starting to look a lot more like the Medicaid plans. And because that's just how it's now uh, implemented. Anyway, what was your question, Gary? Okay. <laughs> anyway, Michael will answer so your question. <laughs> so um, in this whole notion of encouraging people to explore these partnerships, what are the kind of things that you want to see from your partners as they begin to get their data together and their contracting strategies together? What are the kind of things you want, you, you, so you, if you were a consultant to them, what would you be advising them to be thinking about? I mean, so fundamentally, I mean, I gave you some of the models. I, I laid them out earlier, and I would, just, I, I, would, I would stay with those. But I would, I would say, think about, don't be afraid to ask us, but also think about in advance what our issues are, right? So we have the cost issues, right? I think that, that you probably know well about, right? And so how do we keep people out of hospitals? And how do we keep people out of nursing homes? And, and those are all things that uh, uh, are not only money savers, but also better for members and patients. Um, but think about also, we have other metrics that we're responsible for that may or may not be tied to dollars. Uh, you know, um, Jeff mentioned earlier about HEDIS, right? So HEDIS on the, on the Medicaid side is a really important set of measures for us. The states all look at our HEDIS measures. They're public, they're, they're usually published for everyone to see. Um, contract awards will be based on that. Uh, oftentimes some dollars are, are associated with being able to achieve those goals. So familiarize yourself with those HEDIS measures. Talk to us and then think about which measures you think you can impact because then there's opportunities for us to work on those. I would also say, 
Think about STARS measures, right? So uh, for when you're dealing with Medicare Advantage plans, STARS rules the day. Um, if, if, if plans can't have, if plans can't get to that fourth star, or that four and a half, I mean, God, you know, if they can get to four and a half or five stars, it's even better. But if they can't get to that four star, there are big financial implications for a Medicare Advantage plan. Um, and so think of, and there's a lot of things that you all can do to help in terms of thinking about, um, you know, making sure some of the health outcome stuff that, ha that needs to be in there and some of the, the patient quality measures. Take a look for those stars measures because there are things that you can do to assist. Um, and I would say then for the financial alignment demonstrations, if you're in any states that have those, um, stars matter there too. Uh, CMS just said that there will be stars for the, for the MMP programs. Um, but these programs also have very specific quality withholds. And so they're very specific quality measures. These are also, again, all public. So look at those. Think about the ones that you think you can have an opportunity to impact and then come to us with ideas. Um, we're happy to engage in those conversations. We're looking to solve these problems and we know that we can't solve it all on our own. We're looking for thought partners, people that can help us um, in, in, our, in our market. So think about your, don't think about it as a, as a, as a dueling relationship, right? Um, I think if you think about the health plan provider relationship as, um, as the scrum, um, then, then you have, then, then, then you're not thinking it from the right place. Think about how you can create win-win situations. And if you come to us and you bring the data that shows that you can create win-win situations, we will be very interested in that and we'll be thinking about how we work with you. And I guess the last thing I would say is, depending on your market, you may be one DNA, right, in a market, but we might serve as a whole state. So then start to think about how you can get together with your colleagues here in this room or even go multi-state, right? So, like I said, we have dual demonstrations in five states and LTSS in six states with more coming. So it would be great for us if we could have an opportunity to work with one entity who could think about how to drive quality and drive performance on all these things. So think about, and certainly within a state, covering that, that ground. Wait one second, please. Now you can speak. So, you know, payers are pretty complex organizations. Who should we be approaching? You know, is it the CMO? Is it, so if we are going to offer these kinds of services, how do we get the foot in the door and who is it that we talk to? That's a great question, and I wish I could give you a simple answer. It's going to depend on the plan because different plans will approach these things in different ways. Certainly your provider relations representative is a great thing. place to start, right? Yeah. Um, they should be in tune with this. Um, but if you can't, if, if that person's not engaged for some reason, then I would look to medical management. I'd look to see if there's someone like me who's a product person, right? Because um, that's what we do. We, as product people, we're focusing on how do we change these things. So don't be shy about reaching out to multiple folks in the plan. If, if you get to a provider rep who maybe is not responding the way you would think that they would respond. It, CFO may be a good one too. They're the ones that are concerned about the money. Usually if you get paired the, pay, the pair relation, or provider relations and the CFO, those are usually a pretty good combination. It's amazing how CFOs now go to the quality meetings and understand yep. it because it's tied to reimbursement, which is a whole new paradigm shift in being a CFO. And they're pretty articulate in um, their ability to talk about HEDIS and CHAPS. And Bob, I would also add that to the extent that BNAA can help, and we have a strong partnership with Jeff's group, and if we can collaborate um, between our two groups to identify the right people to contact at these various plans, we're glad to do that. So, I want to thank this incredible panel. Um, you know, we started out with uh, a broad theme of the role that you all play in driving population health management. We took a deep dive here into what we believe to be one of the most significant areas of opportunities in this new healthcare delivery realm. And not only did these four gentlemen give you some outstanding insights and incredible perspective, they sat on those stools for an hour and a half. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you um, for your insights, for your partnership, and for staying until the end of the conference to share with us um, some important information. So I want to give you three takeaways, and I want to give you three asks, or I want to make three asks of you. So the first is on the broad perspective. Um, we really sought to identify 
the opportunities that exist in population health and the significant and critical role that you play in population health programs. And I think that on a more narrow and targeted level, we have also been able to provide you over the last two and a half days uh, some excellent tactical case studies for how you can do that. We've heard some fantastic feedback from the concurrent sessions from both of our plenaries, and I hope that we've been able to provide you with some of those insights. The third takeaway that I think I've heard in every single session that I've been in is that fee-for-service is not only on hospice, but the projected length of stay is fairly short. So I think it's safe to say that we all need to be looking at the other payment models that are out there, identifying our roles and demonstrating our value in them. So now my asks. First of all, I'd like you to mark your calendars, so get out your calendars. Um, September 16th through 18th in Washington will be the PPLC, the Public Policy Leadership Conference. We purposely don't address policy issues here at a, a great scale because of the uh, focus that we have on policy and regulatory issues in Washington in September, and I do hope you'll join us there. Um, the second calendar is next year, April 6th through 8th in Miami for the 2016 annual meeting. We truly spend well over a year planning these conferences. We've already started uh, focusing on things we want to do differently in Miami, areas that we want to focus on, and challenges that we want to address. So we welcome your feedback, and we hope to see you there. My second ask is that you please tell your colleagues and other organizations the value that you found in this year's conference so that we can continue to grow. Our numbers have grown over the last couple of years, and I'm very happy about that, but they're not growing at the pace that we would like them to grow. So I hope to see you and more of your colleagues next year. And my final ask is that you please thank the VNAA staff. They do an outstanding job. We are a small team, but they are passionate about their support for our members and this segment of the industry. So if you would join me in thanking the VNAA staff for the work that they do. Thank you. And finally, I want to thank you. I know that it is a significant commitment to take time away from your office, from your staff, from your own challenges to spend the money to come here and spend time with us. I appreciate that you find value in the work that we're doing and we seek to continue to improve in our representation of you and then the services that we provide to you going forward. So please let us know how we can do that. And with that, I will close the 2015 VNAA annual meeting. I will invite our affiliate member agencies to uh, grab a box lunch and to come back so that we may have our annual member business meeting. And that will start in 15 minutes. Safe travels to you all, and I look forward to seeing you in Miami. Thank you. <laughs>